Happy weekend, everyone. It's Invisible Walls, episode 142 on GameTrailers.com. Welcome to our little video podcast we have going on here. Marcus made it today. I did not know if he would. I didn't know if I, w- I would. I thought I'd still be in the ER, but no, I'm I'm, av- I'm alive. So Jason yeah. finally got to you? Yeah, Bobby Kotick was wrong. <laughs> finally sent out a hit. <laughs> He literally has almost died twice in the last week, so the guy definitely deserves some props for making it in to record the show today. I don't want to scare my mother, who actually has started listening to this podcast. <laughs> it was just another <laughs> asthma attack, Mom. I'm fine. I don't know. An undead Marcus beer would be pretty cool. Yeah. So make sure you're extra close to the mic this week, Marcus. You got it. <laughs> we do have a good show. The games are starting to roll in. We went to CES. Got a couple here people here to talk to you about that. Obviously, the 3DS is about to come out. Had a big event in Japan going to talk about that today and here to do that obviously is marcus hello and i'm sucking a throat lozenge so bear with me no sucking on this show marcus (laughs) isn't that what we do every week (laughs) ryan stevens is here yo daniel bloodworth is in the house hello hello and patrick morales on the show shalom get ready to brawl Okay, so first we're going to talk about CES 2011. Now, this event has seemed to lose gaming relevance year after year. In fact, we're at the point now where we just send two guys to go and cover the show. Luckily for us, those two guys are here with us to talk to us about it. Daniel Bloodworth and Patrick Morales, who are big Yo. Vegas fans. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Huge, huge. They look like, so enthused. Yeah, they, <laughs> they bleed <laughs> neon. They really like, you know, Cirque du Soleil. <laughs> You know, Show magic. Hey, Patrick, Patrick, Wayne Patrick Newton. is up to like 5 a.m., I think. <laughs> yeah. All right, who was at the Star Trek experience? <laughs> Which one of you still smells like cheap perfume? Uh, that would be Ryan, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I actually secrete that. <laughs> So you guys went to the show. Amber Obviously, Grimes. you know, games have kind of fallen to the side at that show. I think this year 3D yep. TVs are all the rage. And the internet TVs. Right. Everything being built into the TV now is, right. is apparently the new craze. But let's talk mm-hmm. about games first. We'll talk on we'll touch on tech just really briefly in a moment. But right. what was the game scene like there? I know we didn't get a whole lot of invites from publishers to go and check stuff out, so yeah, I mean, it's there's such little stuff there, and it's so spread out in such a huge show. It, unless somebody emails us and tells us where they are, there's not much chance of us finding them. Like, I think there's halls we didn't even make it to. Yeah, know? just for, if you've never been to CES, just for the folks listening or, or watching, watching this, CES is absolutely monstrous. Mm-hmm. It is probably five times the size of E3. There's a room at CES just for car stereos that's about half the size of E3. So, like you said, and the and the whole thing is just jammed with like cell phone cases and like all these stupid little trinkets that it is really difficult. Even if you know the number of the booth that you're going to, it can still be almost impossible to find. Yeah, the booth. I had to look on a map at one point. Yeah, yeah it's crazy. Booth. And basically, there's so much uh, electronics kind of running there at, at the same time that my cell phone didn't work for the entire weekend just because of all the radio interference. One thing I love about CES is the smell of transistors. You lie like a rug. No, I love that <laughs> smell, man. I love the smell of electronics turned on. And when you have that much stuff in one room, it's like, you know how some people get off on opening action figures and, like, smelling the smell? <laughs> I don't know what that's called, but there's... Jeremy Hoffman. <laughs> Creepy. <laughs> Creepy. For some reason, the smell of electronics does the same thing for me, and there's no better place to get that than there. You know what I always loved about CES? That the porn awards, the porn awards were always held, the porn awards were always held at the same weekend, right across the street, right Mike. across the way. So it was like, all right, you guys go and look after the press. I'm just going across the, to the porn <laughs> awards. Thank you. Yeah, we do actually go and cover that for Spike.com as well. So while these guys are across the street at CES, we have guys from Spike.com over at AEE, probably having a whole lot more fun than you guys had. Yeah. Yeah. We're not. I, can I, I go imagine. work for Spike now? <laughs> no. <laughs> so uh, what were sort of the big games you guys saw? What were the big announcements? Yeah. Well, actually the. Uh, Sony actually stepped it up as far as game space in their booth. They actually had a section with, you know, just PS3 games. Uh, but as far as new stuff, man, it was, no. What about Microsoft? <laughs> no. Now, Microsoft usually has a huge booth there. Like, right when you But all of their games were things that were already out. The only yeah. thing that wasn't out yet was, like, the uh, Fable 3 for PC. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering what they're hoping to accomplish with that, showing games that people 
can already buy. It's well, a different I mean, market. Yeah, market you gotta remember, it is CES. Them. It's consumer. It's a, a consumer electronic show. It's a public show. It's not a trade show. It's not like E3 where you've got the press and you've got the buyers coming around who are seeing stuff that's going to be out at Christmas. This is 100% for the public. So put it, you know, unless you, you've got a game that's coming out, say, in the next six weeks and you want to really stimulate the pre-orders, there's not much point in putting it out this early. You don't want people playing it because then it throws away chances of betas and uh, and all that other fun stuff that you get to do in the PR marketing cycle. So, I mean, I can't, I mean, CES is, uh, you know, it's, it's become less and less every year. We've got E3. I think anybody who goes to CES now as a game that's just well, about to ship or I, uh, has shipped and they just want, you know, oh, look, play, play this, whether it be Fable 3 or, you know, on the PC, it's coming out, go and put a pre-order in. That's all That's all there is to it, really. I, I mean, I've been scheduling CES for game trailers for the last 200 years. Some, I don't, I don't, I don't know, I lose track. There's no seasons anymore. But uh, it seems like it's uh, it's never been the biggest blip, but... Uh, it like this year in particular it seems to have waned quite a bit. Well, Capcom um, we went in there do... with a schedule of like two appointments. Yeah, <laughs> well, didn't Capcom yeah, normally and used to have some sort of no, blow there, at there CES was, every year? It was normally they, they had one this year too, but yeah. um, but yeah, it's this off-site, year, yeah, it's yeah, at the convention. This year in particular uh, seemed pretty tiny, and you know, then sometimes people like didn't you? You guys found some like random dudes hanging out at like you know like wasn't didn't you see like some like. What did I see? Like the 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 blob two was at like some random Samsung or something. Oh, like and it was that. Like yeah, NBC Universal. Yeah, they, like, people kind of have like these weird little, little partnerships. In there. But you know, there's not usually there's not even PR people here. It's like they bring the this is like the brand managers get to come out and like rub shoulders with the you know the common folk and be like, hey, do you want to see our game that's already out or coming out in the next couple of weeks? Well, that's the thing. I mean, the, the press turnout is, st- is still people go every year. I mean, obviously you sent. You know these two poor bastards and a, and a camera crew, uh, so I mean you know the press still go, but yeah, there's there's nothing behind closed doors. It's, I mean a couple right couple show, years right. ago though they they debuted the new uh, Soul Caliber, and, and that's Bandai why did. we go because every once in a while we get some little nugget from that show that we're like, oh, what if we well, don't go this year and well, something like that. Two happens. years ago we got so much good Killzone Two stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, last year Mass Effect was right around the corner, but we got great Mass Effect uh, Two things. Oh yeah, Gran Turismo is always, the <laughs> perennial favorite of Gran Turismo Five is always there. Well, that's that's pretty much the target market. I mean, that's all you need to do is just go and tell everybody who's looking at the car fucking stereos that GT Five is there, and they'll yeah. be masturbating <laughs> over it for a month. I mean, I think yeah. the one new thing we got some gameplay of like MLB Eleven, the show. Mm. Oh yeah, that's usually where it debuts. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's actually kind of funny. They haven't shown that game yet, so right. we have that. Um, in terms of announcements, obviously they're holding most of the big stuff for trade shows like E Three. But one cool thing that uh, we happened to notice was that Razer is kind of edging their way into the uh, kind of game hardware market. Uh, have you guys seen the Switchblade? Yeah. It's kind of a cool little gadget. Um, we got to see it up close behind closed doors, and it ran uh, Warcraft 3, I believe. Yeah, it's running like, Warcraft, this is the, World of Warcraft. This is, the, Warcraft, um, this is the, the mini PC, the mini gaming PC that I that actually was the one thing that gave me a boner to see yes this year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're like hotkeys like, just by default, right? Yeah, the cool thing about it is that uh, what it does is it reads the game's UI and it tries to break down the individual elements so that it's displayed as a touchpad onto uh, the kind of peripheral and it changes per game um, the one thing that kind of concerns me though is that obviously it's like a little you know self-contained thing so you can't really upgrade it and just the way just how fast technology moves it's going to get outdated really quickly and it seems like it's going to be a really expensive thing at the outset to begin with well, what's better than the jungle though was the jungle <laughs> yeah. there did you guys step by no, the i don't know well it has an atom processor which is what is in my little web book yeah. my web book cannot run games actually they were saying they weren't really revealing what the processor was like on any of the specs they weren't actually talking about there but it's basically a little netbook though yeah, yeah. is what it is so yeah. they think they're going to be able to run high-powered games on that thing? Not, not, not high-powered. Yeah. Uh, they want to run the most popular games out there that people are playing online, like, you know, your Team Fortress 2s, your World of Warcrafts. Um, and from the little demo that we saw, it seemed to run them pretty capably. But again, you know, when it finally comes out, I wouldn't be surprised if it seems really outdated by the time, you know, the netbooks hit the market at that time. It makes sense to actually target those sort of games or the MMOs because those <laughs> those games have the lowest common denominator with, with regards to their low end specs, so they will always be at a you know yeah. at a certain <laughs> level. So in the three years' time you still should be able to run WoW. You won't be able to run anything that's on the new Crytek engine or the new, you know, Unreal yeah. engine. But uh, you know, you should be able to run WoW and uh, City of Heroes and yeah. I mean, they're actually, you know, that's actually not a, not too bad uh, an experience to be able to run some of your old fun PC games mm. uh, because you're not really looking for a hardcore grinding session. 
you just basically go in and have a little bit of you know have, have a bit of fun with Dungeon Keeper or Populous or some of that old school shit. Which should anything really from England. Pretty much, <laughs> basically, yeah. Okay. Um, um, no, you know, the, the Fallout Egg, One, Fallout Two, Chuck Jet Egg. Set, Willie. Um, you think you know that thing will run Fallout Two though? Fallout Two. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah totally. It'll run Fallout Two. Yeah, that's totally. from like ninety nine or something. Yeah, I mean, it'll yeah. probably run Fallout Three as well. I mean, they're saying yeah, it won't run Crisis on Mac settings, but I mean, I think it can run a lot of games. I'm assuming they're probably doing what Alienware did with the M11 X, where they're gonna skimp on the CPU and put everything into the GPU. So um, a lot of games are more GPU dependent than CPU these days. So. I concur. But speaking about... Uh, Windows 7 phones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, speaking about Microsoft, Windows 7 phones were big at the show, uh, running Xbox Live games. So that was definitely a strong presence as well. Now, yeah. would you recommend anybody as a gamer attends CES? Well, this is still a, I mean, it's still a business show. Yeah. I mean, it's not like it's just open for anyone to buy tickets. I mean, it's it's one of those things where it'd be neat to, to like look around and stuff. But I mean, it's not you're not gonna go and like see the hot new games really that much. You know, there's a few things that we saw. I mean, it's nice to sit down and play Killzone co-op. But I mean, we've had that here in the office as well. And the preview code and the Infamous Two demo was the same one from E3 with the updated coal. So you know, there wasn't a whole lot there unless you know. Ma- oh, maybe if you're a gamer, if you wanted to play the games in 3D because you don't have a 3D TV, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's nice. Yeah, I mean, if you work at Best Buy and you can get in for free, and you want to go to Vegas and check out cool gadgets, sure. But uh, just from a gamer's perspective, it's not really that worth it. You'd have more fun at the Spearmint Rhino, I'm guessing. Uh, ah, yeah. Sapphire's all the way, dude. If you're gonna go to Vegas for CES, go for one day to CES and then spend the other day doing a, sto- uh, a, t- a tour of the strip clubs. The Little Big Planet community, a landscape of the fantastic. You'll experience everything from marvelous machines to frightful fantasies and all the shades of wonder in between. All right, so next we're going to talk about Little Big Planet 2. Ryan, you've been, you've been playing this game for the last week and a half or so. Yeah, they finally they, they sent us the, the review code, and unfortunately there was no um, servers running for that. So, but we just got retail, and uh, they seems... You could look at things, but you couldn't actually play anything until this were this is Wednesday until last night, which was a little weird. But uh, it kind of goes in, but you could see everything, and it has all of the backwards compatibility with Little Big Planet One, which kind of gets to like kind of my, my, my thesis of Little Big Planet Two. I've never felt a game feel so much like a um, like a like an application, like going from like Word ninety five to <laughs> Word ninety eight or something like that. And it still is a game, and it's still a great game. But it's more like these little tweaks. Like I know when we talk about sequels a lot, we talk about how sometimes it can feel like like a game we can't talk about quite yet. But we were just talking about mm-hmm. sometimes they can feel more like an expansion pack, where there's like tiny little touches, but it's basically the same thing. Here, when you since in a lot of ways, Little Big Planet is an application because you are making your own little levels. Um, it, it, it makes it feel even more like software and less like a game. Like going through the the, the like the single player campaign, still fun, but it still feels almost like a glorified. Let's just show off what you can do now. And there's some incre- incredible stuff. I, I know everyone's seen from the trailers and the like that. There's the shooting levels. There's the quasi first person, more like a light gun game kind of shooting stuff. There's the controlling the new um, devices with the PlayStation controller. And then there's things like uh, the grappling hook, uh, the creator. And like this, like new uh, kind of like what's it, the grabinator and stuff. And these are all kind of like extensions of the verbs. I mean, Little Big Planet one was you could jump and you could grab, and then there was the occasional jetpack, which right. let you kind of fly around. And you know, people, you know, people still they hacked the crap out of that game. You know, people built Tetris, people built all these things with the rudimentary tools that were now that, that have been expanded this time around. But it, like jumping into like create mode, it still feels a lot like the first Little Big Planet. Yes, you can change. It's more easy to change like camera angles. Um, the water from the, the one of the last big content patches is there, of course. Um, but and, and it looks. It would, I would say it looks marginally better. Um, I mean, the first game already had a really nice look, yeah. but here it does. It does still. It's. I mean, that game came out a while ago. It still stands the test of time. But it really feels like an application upgrade more than like a, a real sequel or even like an expansion pack. And going through the levels, it's insane that they can make a a shooter. A heart, they have a level that's both a horizontal and a vertical shooter, and it goes quick enough. But if you start to think about it, I mean, it, it's never really. That maybe that much fun, you know, just sitting there pounding the buttons. That's and my question. 
the campaign in this game. You, you said it kind of shows off what the tools are capable of, but mm-hmm. is it is it actually fun? Because what I found with a lot of people sort of <clears throat> post-launch with the first game was I'd ask them how they liked it, and they're like, well, I didn't really get into the building part of it or any of the downloading part of it. I just played the game, and I don't know what the big deal is with this game. Well, that's definitely not the way to, to go about the game. I mean, like, uh, I would not buy this game just for the single-player levels uh, up, up, um, supplied. I would say I thought the first game of single player campaign was actually pretty fun. Uh, this one I, I felt a lot shorter to me, and it's still fun to get through. But all of the the big things that people did not enjoy about the first game, the floaty controls, and we know why they're there. They're there so you can make it a level that has this margin of error where not everything has to be you know a super Meat Boy pixel perfect jumps and stuff like that. And uh, you know the conceit of going into the background and the foreground is still clumsy at best um it can still be really awkward and whatnot but it it feels again like the first game and like i said you know the things like the grappling hook it's kind of it's it's not really anything that much new it's an extension of jumping and grabbing onto things which you could already do before yes you can it, it adds a little more of the velocity of things and there are some unique ways where you can use it like you know pulling instead of trying to grapple up to somewhere for a swing, you know, pulling a switch or something like that. But it doesn't really extend the, the, the vocabulary of moves too much to your, your little sack boy. Um, what was more impressive was a lot of the little mini games that you unlock that aren't, uh, you know, they're not canon to the story, but there's some crazy stuff. <laughs> That's like, funny. Uh, one of the most impressive additions, though, is the, the, the sack bots. Because this is before when you could make enemies, you know, they were literally like Frankenstein together from all the construction bots, and you tinker in these little brains you know like move towards the player if the player gets close and you know they're covered in plasma or electricity the sack bots are uh they they can run away from you they can be attracted to you some of them can run some of them can jump you can equip them with everything and you can actually go into their brains and lay down all of these ai behaviors i mean yes it gets convoluted but you know you can it's really easy to just plaster a bunch of them and just you know walk around with them and those i thought that personally i thought those were the most enjoyable single player levels because it seemed a lot different and with all the shooting and like riding these weird little vehicles and stuff like that the platforming took a little bit of a back seat as they tried to extend things like just use the grappling hook a lot you know like here's your item use it there's there's still some like good levels and visually there's there's still this one level that kind of goes like this 8-bit look which i'm still not exactly sure how they did that and when it comes to building there's 52 tutorials. I think it took me about wow. three and a half hours to go through them all. And it's still, it, even giving you a basic run of all the tools, it's still like not that easy to figure out how, how, how can I make a shooter level? Yeah. Uh, speaking to so the creation tools. be templates of some kind. Well, that's where like, you know, the sharing's going to come in and, you know, like levels and the like. But uh, as of right now, um, I was trying to find levels that were specifically Little Big Planet 2 levels. And I don't really think there's that, that many posted. I mean, uh, we got the retail, but it only looks like uh, there's only 100 or so people playing right now. I have the high score on the second level. <laughs> <laughs> Take that, Eurogamer. Um, uh, real quick, speaking to the creation tools, you mentioned how Little Big Planet 2 feels more of an application than the first game. Um, well, no, I, I feel like the, the idea of this being a sequel, it feels more okay. like an applic- like an app. It makes the whole overall experience feel more like an application. Right. Um, Speaking about the creation tools, do you feel that it still kind of maintains that WYSIWYG, you know, let's just build things visually, or does it actually kind of get deeper into it with, like, coding and stuff? Um, there's way more logic stuff, and like I said with the switchboards, it basically throws up a little um, a little window where you can plaster on, because his, and since there is a visual component, like, all that logic has to live in a visual thing, even though it can be invisible when you play the game. It basically allows you to wrap it up into a little package. Who do you recommend this game for? Well, I think the real interesting question is, do you need it if you have Little Big Planet One? I think if you are a big builder and the idea of these these kind of point upgrade things seem interesting to you, then definitely check it out. If you've never picked up Little Big Planet One, by all means, we get Little Big Planet Two instead because it's that reverse compatible with all of the levels that have been made. Um, there's an endless amount of content and I've played some uh, user levels but again I, I think for the most part all the user like not counting the stuff from the beta all the user levels I've been playing uh, last night were from Little Big Planet 1 and there, there's moments of fun there's moments of brilliance but a lot of the time when you're playing it even if you're not a big builder I think you're like oh there's a lot of how did they do that it's like my my horrible experiences with Second Life a little bit where people were never really playing anything in Second Life people were just thinking of how you can build it was uh, kind of a means to an end more than like actually kind of the experience. Not to say that these levels aren't fun and there's some good platforming to be had, 
But uh, I, I still also think the game works best in its platformer roots, even though, you know, these, uh, like, little excavations of shooting and weirdness definitely, you know, break up some monotony of, uh, you know, trying to figure out what plane I am on and uh, why my, was my jumping so fuzzy. The ship has been compromised. All units must evacuate. So, Marcus, remind me again, what has been one of your most anticipated games of the last couple years? Mass Effect 3. No, that's, Fall not, out 4. that's not the game I'm thinking of. Uh, the Old Republic. I think it had, like, superheroes in it, and maybe it was on It had all the good superheroes. It had, like, Magneto and Wolverine. <laughs> and oh, no, that was, that, that, that was the one that got canceled by Microsoft about three years ago. Oh, you wanted the one with the silly villains. <laughs> uh, yeah, apparently. <laughs> What's yeah, it called? DC Universe Online was one of my you know anticipate most anticipated games a couple of years running, and I've made no bones about it. I'm a comic book fan. I'm a MMO, MMO fan. And I was, you know, hoping for the longest time they were going to learn from the mistakes of Champions Online and City of Heroes and really do a great superhero MMO. Bum, bum, ba, dum. And, it came, and it came out yesterday, and Patrick and I have been playing it. Yes. It's not atrocious. <laughs> it's not atrocious. <laughs> it is not atrocious. And, you know, we have only been playing it for, you know, the best part of 12 hours or so because, it, yes, it was the first day of launch. But and like Head and Shoulders, days. you only get one chance to make a first impression. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> remember when I said I was going to start playing MMOs on consoles at the end of the year last year? Well, I I, ironically, for a little while, you know, I've been playing the PC version. Patrick's been playing the PS3 version, and there doesn't seem to be much of a difference between them. Nah, lots of patching, huh? Uh, already? Yeah. Oh, it was great. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, on, on day one, it's it was like a eight, eight gigabyte. Point, it was eight point eight gigs, which which Wasn't confuses me. Whoa. PC and PS3. Yeah, it, Whoa. it's really puzzling because the Blu-ray <laughs> gigs. Yeah, the Blu-ray should conceivably hold that much data, right? Oh yeah. So and the PC I don't know why came on two I DVDs. Had to much. Yeah, the Blu-ray holds twenty five gigs, I believe. Yeah. Well, the, the PC came on two DVDs, and and yeah, I mean. After I installed Direct or reinstalled DirectX and then sat down and waited for an hour and a half for the 8.8 gigs. You downloaded an eight and a half gigs in an hour and a half? It was That's pretty good. It was DSL. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. My DSL. But, <laughs> but yeah, it was it was a good ninety minutes on you know, after everything, uh, that that it just, you know, took a it took an age and uh, it's obviously a work in progress and you know, it is the first twenty four hours of M- any MMO and usually a little little rocky. It, it, I mean, you know, no problems with connections at all. I've managed to get into my, you know, into my servers every time. No problems with the character setups. But when, you know, you create your different archetypes and, you know, th- whatever archetype you create, whether it be, you know, Batman is your mentor or Superman or... Um, now, you cannot play as Batman, Superman, blah, blah, blah. No, you can play as, their, as, uh, as sort of like... Uh, Cheap knockoffs. Cheap knockoffs, basically. <laughs> and, you know, pa- Patrick's playing. You're playing as a Superman knockoff. Bad dude. And I've got a Batman knockoff. Yeah. The idea in the game is that uh, there's this kind of invasion going on in Earth, and uh, they use these little technological insects to kind of siphon the DNA from all the superheroes on uh, Earth. And they're kind of re infusing that into humans as kind of test subjects. So that kind of explains the outset of all these, you know. Not that they really superheroes. needed to. Well, I gotta yeah. say, the intro movie. It's freaking good. Is the it? intro movie is, that is the, good. Is this the, the huge twenty-minute-long trailer? It is. Yeah, the, hu- the huge pitch battle between Luthor's people and Superman, and um, it actually is very well directed. And it's uh, you know th- that's and probably not made by the team that actually made the game. <laughs> no, that was actually I think that was d- done by Bruce Tim and the DC yeah. animation team. I mean, because they had the they had all the voices in there of the the you know the the cartoon people. Did you get a DC chubby when you watched it? No, I didn't get a DC chubby. <laughs> uh, but no, I enjoyed it. And then, you know. Yeah, I enjoyed get, the movie. I enjoyed the movie. And then you get into the game. You the tissue afterwards. <laughs> um, if it's, to me, it seems, you know, they, they've purposely decided to copy City of Heroes. And it's City of Heroes when it first launched with a much snazzier engine. I mean, the game looks pretty. It's Unreal 3. Yeah. And it runs nicely on my, on my laptop. Um, you know. When you say City of Heroes, that makes me think, and I, I've I've seen a couple demos of the game, but I've not I don't know too too much about it. Um, but when I hear City of Heroes, I think kind of quick gameplay, quick combat, big focus on combat, mm-hmm. and yeah, uh, it's a brawler. But also uh, kind of sparse in in the yep. other departments. Like, you, is there inventory and stuff like that? Or there is. You see a lot of the conventions in other MMOs. <laughs> like you know you. 
earn equipment, you quest, uh, you know, you explore the world. It still has all of that in there. But like State of Heroes, it's kind of bare bones. One of the things that I didn't like about State of Heroes was that it was a little formless in terms of uh, kind of class roles. Like, you know, how MMOs, you know, usually have the tank, the, you know, DPS, the heals. Pretty much you create the hero you want and then you kind of face roll your way through every quest and instance in the game. There doesn't seem to be a huge emphasis on group group play right now, at least in the very beginning. And uh, one thing that is kind of cool, though, is that they do have open PvP events throughout the city. So every once in a while, they'll kind of rally up all the heroes and villains and kind of encourage like open combat between the two in like a little arena. So that's neat. But um, it, it does feel very City of Heroes where it kind of banks on these very established MMO conventions, but doesn't really go too far with it, you know. Now, from the developer standpoint, is that a mistake? Because City of Heroes has been pretty enduring. Well, City of Heroes has lasted, and there's a lot of hardcore fans. There's a lot of hardcore fans out there still. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, Megan, I, in fact, still plays City of Heroes. I went a back. Girl. To, I went back <laughs> to play City of Heroes last year, and honestly, it kind of left me cold. Uh, it is pretty dated. It's. It is. Yeah, it is really quite dated, and I. Do, I don't think. Uh, there seems to be this whole premise with a lot of MMO people right now that, that oh, we can't do what, what World of Warcraft does. And I'm not saying World of Warcraft is perfect. It's not. There's there's still a lot of issues with it. You know, the hardcore and and newbies will have, you know, have issues with it. But I'm beginning to think it does so much of the basics right that taking that those basic prem, uh, you know presets and slapping skins on them, whether they be Star Wars skins or superhero skins, is actually probably a good, a good way idea. to get going. <laughs> because they, they right. do do a lot of stuff very, very well. I mean, the UI is a little unwieldy. I mean, just, you know, quitting in and out. I mean, you know, the PS3 version, the lag oh, yeah. time you get, just, you know, going from menu screen to menu screen. It just, you know, the, the trade, it doesn't feel immersive. You know, when you're going in and you're going to buy stuff from people, there's not much of an explanation behind what you're buying. Uh, and why you need to buy it. I mean, it it just seems very much sort of like, th- there you go, I'm going to throw you in the deep end, swim See, away. you know, I would, I would make a small argument that WoW is definitely good at what it does, but if you throw someone into the deep end of, or you start anyone off on WoW, and yes, it is it is way user-friendly with their little tooltips and stuff, but it's still throwing a lot of stuff at you. It's still, MMOs are unwieldy. They're the, complicated. But, yeah. I mean, WoW has, and they've managed to refine that experience for the new player coming in. What's There's the on, monthly charge for the game? It's 15 bucks. Yeah. And free first month, I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah, first thirty days free. Um, and it has been a bit of a rocky start, and not the greatest impression, first impression. But I think to DCUO's credit, um, we haven't really seen this strong a push of an MMO on a console since I guess Final Fantasy XI. Yeah. And despite some kind of janky tech problems, like you know slow menus popping up, I've had the game crash on me. I've had corrupted data. It's if once you kind of get the <laughs> wheels rolling, it is actually it handles pretty decently on a PS3, which I kind of have to give it credit for. Yeah, that's the big question. I mean, how does it play with a controller? Pretty well. Um, I think that's partly due to the fact that it doesn't control like your standard MMO. It actually kind of fits more the mold of a beat 'em up brawler, as Marcus said. Something I am disappointed though is that even though it kind of goes out of its way to kind of evoke a more action-oriented experience. You know, you do combos, you do kind of like positional moves, you jump around, you run, you fly. It doesn't really weave that into the overlying kind of questing in a very neat way. It's still very much, you know, kill 10 of these guys, then go over here and destroy these five things. Everything in the game is answered by just beating it up. It doesn't do any kind of cool things like, you know, stealth missions or, you know, infiltration or like you know escort or anything kind of out of the box it's like very 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 escort s- missions out of the box <laughs> uh, you know, i mean to be fair <laughs> or, or, or anything out of the box right we, we're both low level characters yeah. right now i mean that's you know, true that, and that can improve it is our first 20 quick. you know 24 hours i think it's something that perhaps in at the end of our 30 day subscription i, I think you know, me and patrick will come back and we will give our updated impression as to you know are we going to switch carry on and start paying for it um see how it is when we you know we've both got you know 30 or 40 you know, levels behind us. I'm hoping it's going to improve and evolve. As of right now, would you see yourself playing a second month of it? Ask me again in two weeks. We'll do that. Nintendo World 2011. All right, everyone. So here comes the 3DS party about to hit the United States in a couple months. Had the big party in Japan already. Kind of released all the specs for the system. Some good, some not so good. So, actually, some of them really not so good. 
battery life. Oh, mm. yeah, that battery life spec that came out. I think that was vastly underwhelming. I mean, that that's PSP levels worse than PSP. Well, the levels. Pro- the real problem is, yeah. is that it takes as long to charge it as it does to expel it. It's like one to one. I thought that was a typo at first. Like, there's no way to. That's real. Wow, that's like pretty three bad. and a half hours to charge it, and then three and a half hours, and it's dead. And that's three and a half hours in 3D mode. And I'm guessing you can turn 3D modes off right. to get an extra hour and a half of battery time. And I mean, to be fair, Nintendo does always undersell its handhelds. Like a lot of times, they'll say, "Oh, it gets seven hours," and it really gets like ten or eleven. Yeah, there are times where like I won't charge my DS for like a week, and I'm using it every day. And like, oh, my DS is a beast; it yeah. never needs a charge. But they also advertise that as like twelve hours, and it gets a little more than that. So if they're saying three and a half, we're probably guessing around five. It's actually a very smart business tactic: under promise and over deliver. It is. Yeah, I'm, I was just laughing at some of the people who are like raging over this, and they're like, "I'm going to wait for the eventual redesign this fall." And I'm like, "This, this fall? fall? Yeah, good luck." Well, with that. when is that? No, that's not happening. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's a, they're just covering their butts and like prepping people for it's not going to be as like as robust as the DS, DSi, DSi XL. Well, just like but, the health warning last week. Yeah, you know, yeah. Talking, I mean, like that turns out to be almost bogus well the know. doctors now are saying that it actually will train your eyes <laughs> they're going to release like eye training train your eyes in minutes a day like the the sister product for brain training but the casing i cannot get over the colors of the 3ds like i hate the colors we've seen those same colors for a while though right and i still hate them like the two-tone like a lot of times nintendo will show something first and then when they're finally about to release it it looks different they have different colors available but it's looking like they're rolling with that like no there's a the black one there's yeah. a solid there is an all black, all yeah. black yeah. one are you kind of hoping like the all white one like that the yeah i was talking about like yeah. the green and the blue and yeah, like the, the fuchsia and the red yeah there's the the bluish one and then there's the all black one are they so the, the red one's not coming out here at long oh we don't know we don't know anything we don't know anything about what the u.s here. really so japan is just like the Aqua blue and Cosmo black, whatever the heck. Yeah, those are the only yeah. two. And then supposedly Australia is getting a red one. So gotcha. that's all we know. Are those the same colors we saw at E3? All the those blue were the ones. Yeah, those yeah. were the ones that are on display. And then at Nintendo World, uh, they had a few of those. They had the ones that would be in Japan on display. So yeah. So let's talk about the launch games. Eight games that launch in Japan. Only one first party game: Nintendo Dogs and Cats. And then there's a uh, Street Fighter, mm, right, from Capcom. I just found it surprising that it's just Nintendo Dogs and Cats coming from Nintendo, and all those big first-party titles they've been like touting for a while are later in the year. And it's well, Kid Icarus was yeah. supposed to be a launch game. But that's the first game they showed, right? Well, they, I don't know if they ever. Yeah, said I don't it was know if it's a lot, but it's, 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 I can see like it made sense. They showed it off at a big reveal. You would think that would be their like you know their Flagship killer game, app, their yeah. killer app for yeah. it, but I mean. It's just one first party title and a lot of room for third parties. So is this an indication that Nintendo's starting to play nice? Yeah. Well, they, yeah, they, they were, they've already said that they wanted to make it more, you know, available for third parties. And Iwata also said in an interview this week that you know they wanted to avoid that that post launch, you know, dead zone. Yeah. So that, you know, you, here's all these games and then here's nothing, which is kind of what we're seeing with like the move in the connect right now. Yeah. Exactly. I think Zelda will be a Christmas title. They'll basically sell. They'll sell out to, uh, as fast as possible of all these games, and then you know, come September, October, that's when you'll see the second. Only wave. four million units at launch. Well, that's only four. better go put in your pre-order, folks. Well, that's you- four million units worldwide. One point five for Japan, two point five for the rest of the world. But that's only. It's been indicated it's only within Nintendo's financial yeah. year, which ends at the end of March. Right. So, I mean, God knows how many they've got got coming after that. But again, Nintendo past masters of overselling and understocking when it comes to uh, their actual you know, Hardware. units. Yeah. Like that. One of the things that uh, Famitsu just reported on, um, and other sites are reporting on the translation, that apparently the system, as of right now, the system uses game-specific friend codes, is what the article says. Oh, no. And the achievement system is just per game. There's no universal achievement system. So you don't have like a gamer score. Yes. Now, this is only according to two sites that translated it themselves. Has, so, you know, it could be a mistranslation, but that's the new hot topic right now is that Nintendo is still kind of backwards thinking and, and it and it's online, you know, it's not like Xbox Live, it's not it's not like it's like PC in the nineties basically. It's pretty bad. You know? Let's talk a little bit about the games. They did show a ton of games, even if they're not coming out of launch. Uh, Resident Evil I thought looked amazing. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. yeah. The, the, yeah. On I the mean, stream. 
too. The trailers look great, but just seeing that presentation, just seeing it in action, playing it live, it, whoa! And, and the controls look like they work well for that game. Unlike some of like uh, Kid Icarus, it looks like it plays like Sin and Punishment style. Yeah. But you use the stylus to move the camera around, and you're playing. It's like they kind of focus the controls on the left side because yeah. it's like con- Metroid Prime Hunters, is what I. It I looks like it's a little of. cramped, and it looks like it's not comfortable. And that's what some people were saying that they pref- would prefer there's another option for the camera. But Resident Evil seemed to tackle it just fine. So I mean, it can be done. One thing I would say is a lot of the really cooler functionality that I saw. At E3, I haven't seen a lot of games that use that stuff. Like, there were just a lot of little tech demos at E3 that just showed off how the cameras work, how the accelerometers work. A lot of that stuff it doesn't seem like the games really make use of, at least the stuff that they're going to have well, to Well, using the camera to, uh, sorry, using the system to, like, tilting it for the camera control, that's actually how you aim in the first-person mode of Ocarina of Time. When you're using the slingshot, like you tilt it up to like look up, look down. I don't know if there's any other options, but people were saying that's how you use it. And there's a video of it. I don't know how that's going to work when we get our hands on it. It sounds interesting. It just seems back- like at launch, Nintendo should have some kind of, even if it's another one of those corny like mini mini game compilations to just show off everything. Well, it does have the AR games included, you know, the, right. with the the cards and stuff. Okay, so let's just go around the horn, and I want to find out if you guys are actually planning on buying one of these, if you can find one. Now, we don't know the full price in, in the U.S. yet. We're guessing it's probably going to be 250 to 300 somewhere in there. Patrick, do you see yourself getting one at launch? I'm definitely excited about the technology, but I uh, the battery life is a bit of a deal breaker for me. Um, but you know they probably won't fix that for quite some time. So. Right. That being said, I don't really think I'm in that of a rush to pick it up. I've never really been one to kind of pick up tech at the very first wave of it. So I'll wait until the next revision, even though that might be a while off. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely get one at launch. So I'm interested to see what games they have planned for here, because I would expect them to have something else other than Nintendogs. But. Uh, let's hope. <laughs> Damiani? Damiani has the pre-order it. receipt, You can hear the crinkle gentlemen. of the pre-order receipt. Pre-ordered. And how many games do you trade in for that? <laughs> None yet. None yet. None yet. When, now, when did you no. get your pre-order? That day that those rumors were coming out that you could go into U.S. ones and pre-order them. Uh, I just had my friend call up a local game. I was in Texas, actually. I just had my friend like call GameStop and see if they're doing it. If they are, I'll pay you back for it. And my friend went in and did it for both of us. So Think it's too late to get a pre-order now? Oh, no, I'm sure you can go in. I, I just did it because, you know, shame on Nintendo for the Wii launch and how the shortages were, if they were forced or if they really had right. shortages. I don't, I don't want to deal with that. I, I'll just get one. I know there's not going to be a revision for a while. I mean, I'll play Street Fighter. I mean, I do want to play Zelda again, even though it's 10 years old and people like nagging on the visuals and stuff, whatever. It, it's still going to be decent. But yeah, I, I just want to have one. You know, I got the DS Fat when it came out, just because so I, just, I. I don't want shortages. So clunky ass thing, Marcus. Um, I probably won't get one until the beginning of the fall. I want to see what the software lineups are going to be like. I mean, I got the DS a couple of months after it came out, the, the first one, and to be honest with you, it's been lying unused for the longest time. Um, I am not probably their target demographic, but I'm sure it will sell absolute wank loads. Um, but yeah, if I, if I got one right off the bat, it would be very you know covered in dust this this summer. So uh, yeah, I'll wait until um, I know what quality games coming out. I mean, would it be fun to play Ocarina of Time again? Absolutely. If they're going to bring out some of the re- you know some of the old classic stuff from the GameCube um, and, and 3D that up, great. Resident Evil, looking forward to it. But uh, I'll play yours, Shane. Yeah, I am getting one. I'm also a person who has a PSP Go. <laughs> and I bought three different DSs at this point. So Sucker! I'm not a sucker, though. You guys will all be asking me to take my system home just like you just did whenever I get it. Provided I do get it, because it sounds at this point like you're way ahead of the curve. Like, <laughs> Definitely going to pick it up. Hopefully they'll have a couple extra games ready for U.S. launch. I'm not holding my breath. If I have to play Nintendo Dogs and Cats, then oh, shit. A new warrior has entered the ring! All right, everyone, thank you for watching and listening Invisible Walls episode 142. The new year is pretty much in full swing. All the games are finally starting to come out. Also, Pack Attack coming back to GameTrailers.com this Saturday. Brand new season of that. 
Lots of big stuff afoot on game trailers. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Invisible Walls is up and out.